Good afternoon, sir. Hey, my dear brother, it's nice to see you. Honestly speaking, look at you shining. <laughs> Hello. I can hear you. Ah. Good afternoon. Yes, looks sir. like this. Look like this good lockdown to see is you, sir. good. It's good. It's looking like this lockdown is doing real good thing to people in a way. Everybody's shining and uh, put on some weight here and there. <laughs> I can see. I can also see that with Mrs. Nadiko too, as well, <laughs> from your video. It's nice to see all of you, honestly speaking. And thank you for the invitation. Man. Thank you for the privilege to have you, sir. And thanks for the cooperation all the time. Sir. Well, it's a pleasure. I feel highly honoured, honestly speaking. Like I said, I'm not sure if I have what it takes to do this assignment, but you would think I do. Well, I see you say so. All right, sir. You are more than capable, sir. <laughs> well, thank you, for, thank you for, your, for your kind words at all times. It's 2 p.m. from my end. I think we can start. Okay. Okay. okay, a very warm welcome to all our participants joining us across the globe today. Thank you so much for joining us. We thank all our um, Nastima contingent. The it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, sir. Please, our um, preview indulgence, please allow me to read through this. Director General. Ambassador Ayola Lukoni currently serves as the Director General of the Nigerian Association of Chambers of Commerce, Industry, Mines, and Agriculture. He graduated from University of 1999 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Social Sciences, Political Science. He joined the Nigerian Diplomatic Service in July 1980 after his National Youth Service in Just Plato State. His first diplomatic posting was an attachment to the Nigerian Embassy, Brussels, Belgium, Nigeria's diplomatic outpost, which is also concurrently accredited to the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, and which also serves as a Nigerian mission to the European Union. He served in the mission between 1982 and 83. In 1984, he returned to the university for postgraduate studies in international law, and graduated with postgraduate diploma in international law from the University of Lagos. Between December 1986 and April 1989, he served in the permanent mission of Nigeria to the United Nations New York, covering among others the work of the second, third, fourth, and sixth committees of the United Nations, as well as the Security Council. He was thus involved in the work of the United Nations spanning economic and financial matters, South-South cooperation, technical cooperation among developing countries. TCDC, social, cultural, and humanitarian and legal affairs, as well as peace and conflict resolution, and you and in line with his insatiable quest for knowledge, he enrolled for another postgraduate studies at the University of Lagos. He graduated from Unilag in 1991 with Masters of International Law and Diplomacy, with focus on international environmental law. Between 1991 and 1994, he worked at the Bilateral Economic Cooperation Division at the headquarters, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and worked in Tel Aviv, Israel from 1994 to 1998. He served in the mission as counselor, political, culture, and information, following closely the implementation of the Oslo Peace Accord. He also subsequently served in the embassy of the Pilgrim's liaison officer. In January 20, 2000, he returned to the permanent mission to the United Nations in New York to strengthen the mission when Nigeria was unanimously elected as the chairman of the New York chapter of the group of 77 and China. Now, during the period he was, clo during the period, he was closely involved in the United Nations Millennium Summit and the negotiations of the UN Millennium Development Goals, MDGs, as well as the meetings of the first ever South Summit which was held in Havana, Cuba from 10th to 4th April 2000, and where the Havana Declaration and Program of Action of the G77 and China was adopted. 
From 2003 to 2007, Ambassador Olukoni was in Nairobi and served as Acting High Commissioner to Kenya with concurrent accreditation to Seychelles and Acting Permanent Representative to United Nations Environment Program and the United Nations Human Settlement Program. On his return to Nigeria in April 2007, he was appointed Director of Public Communications and Spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In August 2010, he was posted to the Embassy of Nigeria to Austria, which also serves as permanent mission of Nigeria to the UN in Vienna. There he served as charge de fairs to Austria with concurrent accreditation to Slovakia and acting permanent representative to the United Nations office in Vienna, as well as the International Atomic Energy Agency. His other duties include overseeing Nigeria's interest in the following organization based in Vienna, OPEC, OPEC Fund, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, United Nations Industrial Organizations, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, United Nations on Committee on Peaceful Uses of Our Space, United Nations on International Law. Appointed ambassador in 2011, while serving in Vienna and posted to Canberra, Australia. From July 2011 to March 2015, he served as Nigeria's High Commissioner to Australia with concurrent accreditation to New Zealand, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, and Pacific Island of Vanuatu. He returned home from Australia in March 2015 to retire from the Foreign Service on attainment of age and became actively involved in advocacy and motivational speaking circuit on environment, gender, and development issues. In May 2018, after a rigorous process, he was appointed the Director General of NASIMA. He is a passionate environmentalist and serves as the Vice Chairman of an environment NGO, Fight Against Desert Encroachment, and an associate member of the Nigeria Contingent. He is also a member of the Nigeria Association of Nigeria, an avid golfer. He is a cultural enthusiast who loves poetry and theater and engaged in the creative industry for transformative development. He is married to Mrs. Oluyemisi Olukoni and have, they have three daughters and two sons. Your Excellency, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's session. Well, thank you very much for opening. I think that was a long one, but I should have a more abridged version that I'm now, uh, of course, a converted agriculturist. You know, as well, and in, you in the much. private sector. But thank you very much, all the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. To all our participants, thank you so much for joining us once again. Please note that we are live on Facebook. Our handle is West Africa Agribusiness Show. You can join us live on Facebook. Now, I'd like you to, and also please send in your questions through the question and answer segment. When it's, uh, when it's time for it, of course, the moderator will take your questions. Please include your email when sending the questions. At this juncture, please allow oh, me to allow me to hand you over to Mr. Idowa Shenuga, the moderator for today's session. Mr. Shenuga, please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Okwe, for the wonderful uh, introduction. And um, I also want to use this opportunity to once again thank uh, our ambassador, Ayola, for joining us on this special webinar session. Um, Ambassador has been very, very helpful to the last team, where he, he played a very significant role in the last February. And he has not prevented in supporting our efforts towards ensuring that the, there is a paradigm shift in the agribusiness uh, scenario. So, without further ado, um, Ambassador, allow me to make the question of today by asking. Uh, the agri sector, agri business sector is still the devil by lack of long term finance, knowledge, and skill gap, low productivity, low level of private sector investment, non competitiveness, and underdeveloped land ownership and tenor system. How can NASIMA engage both the public and the private sector to solve this area of problems in order to revamp and reposition the agri business sector? Well, um, Zasimga, thank you very much for having me again, it's a pleasure. I feel highly honored anytime there's an opportunity to work with people like you who are not, who are really working the talk, it's always a pleasure. So I'm indeed delighted that WAS is doing this. 
at this particular period. Your question, of course, is quite uh, straightforward. How can NACIMA engage uh, both the public and private sector uh, in terms of the various array of problems that have bedeviled the agricultural sector? I think, I think, I think it's quite clear. Um, we're not reinventing the wheel. We've been on this ground altogether before. And, and I think the, the clear answer is that, one, to see the issue of agriculture now as a business, no longer subsistence farming. I think that is the number one thing. And that's one of the things which we're doing in Nasima, um, promoting agriculture in the new, the new terrain in terms of, hey, listen, the days of agri being seen as subsistence farming, um, food security, yes, part of it is over. Let us take it as a business. And that's why we work closely with members of our chambers across them. Don't forget NASMA is Nigerian Association of Chambers of Commerce, Industry, Mines, and Agriculture. So we project, we project that agriculture uh, through our members. And of course, also ask our members to also support the respective members. And also encourage people to join the chambers so that members who are in agriculture can join the chambers. That is one thing. The second aspect of it is what you talk about the public sector. And I sincerely hope I'm, I'm, I'm clear in terms of what we are saying. And that is the fact that we must work, we work also with government and various agencies too as well. And that's why in this context, I think we must uh, uh, look at the current roadmap as far as agri is concerned. And that is the green alternative, the agricultural promotion policy of green alternative. Uh, which are seven pillars. Um, it is a very useful roadmap, and that's one of the contests. That's one of the that's one of the roadmap, the framework within which we work closely uh, with gov with the public sector, and also have to popularize it because there are so many of these programs out there that very very few people know about them. If you don't know about them, there is no way you can keep keen to them. So that is one of the things we are doing. Uh, the green alternative is indeed. Uh, design, and we use this as one of the reference points in terms of um, trying to sort things out. But the long and short of what we're saying is that the Chamber is the private sector advocacy group. We work closely, of course, through our members, and that's one of the platforms on which we stand and encourage more people to join, even farmers and others, and small oldest farmers to join the Chambers as well, so we can work closely with them. Your mic is muted. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about that. Now, okay. um, just to reflect on that question, you know, uh, once more, because um, I was having a discussion with one of my very close friends lately, lately and we were discussing about the lack of, um, you know, major investment in the agribusiness mm -hmm. sector as uh, one of these critical problems. Uh, would you want to agree that, um, you know, lack of big investment you know, because just like you said, you said agribusiness is a is big time business, it's real business. Well, are, are you satisfied with the level of private sector in investment in that sector, you know, at the moment? Can you quickly just, you know, take... I, 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 think, I think the answer is that no. I mean, we've not, one is not totally satisfied. Uh, Self is concerned in terms of the memory. I think, I think, and I think the problem comes from the perspective that, um, um, we are yet to come to grip with the paradigm shift that agri is no longer subsistence farming, it is business. And I want to make reference to the, the quotation of the current president of the ADB, the person of Dr. Akumi Adeshino, who said that um, agri is the new oil. And people are yet to buy into that. So we must encourage people to look at that. Then you made mention of the question of big business as well. Um, not, 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 we, we need more of it. I mean, with a few outfits like maybe Olams and a few other people and a few other companies that are not just coming to that. And I think the Rise Revolution, which showed us the possibility, um, is an indicative of yet it is possible to do this. Big business, make it big. Because what is the largest farm in terms of what we have in Nigeria? And quickly, if you remember, there was a time we had a big, huge push 
under the Cassava Initiative. I was serving in Nairobi in Kenya at that time, and I remember the National Committee, which was put together by uh, uh, President Ambassador, because if you look at cassava and the various derivatives, it is huge. You can have multi-million dollar investment in that area. Well, it was like, um, you know, let me use the, the allegory that a, a baby is being born and then the sign is going to come out. And then suddenly, uh, it, it came quiet. What I'm saying is that at that particular period, a lot of people showed interest. But the question and issue of sustainability, each time we want to make a dash for it, as far as big business is concerned, is not there. That is part of the problem. And of course, there is other areas in terms of the financing part of it. I will share my own experience recently and subsequently down the road in terms of, I, I, I sat four years in Tel Aviv in Israel. And when I was in Israel, the kibbutz were of keen interest to me. There was a small agricultural settlement. They were producing oranges and other things like that. Um, when the kibbutz were no longer functioning properly as a socialist enclave, Efforts were made to open the opportunity for private capital to come into it. And that's one an area which we should look at in terms of the question of private capital and encourage private capital to come into farming to help this big push. I left Israel in 1998. And then last year, we went with Nasima on an economic visit. And some of the kibbutz which I have, which I knew, well, some of the places we went to. And I was, I was, I was surprised at what has happened. The kibbutz were no longer those small farming, socialist oriented farm. They've opened up for opportunity for crowdfunding from outside. And one of the kibbutz we went to, Dan Shmuel, had opened up for venture capital from outside. So it was no longer the small kibbutz I used to know. They moved on to the value chain to produce juice from oranges they used to export. They used, they, um, from, from grapefruit they used to export. What I'm saying is that opening up and they ask people to, to invest. So they got investors from other places, I mean, from places like Netherlands. All they need to do was just, then they now went on to the TASE. TASE is the stock exchange to float the company and then funds came in. So they could scale up to a level in which you can say, this is a big, huge agriculture. I think these are some of the areas which we need to do. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm glad that steps and effort are on in this particular area. Um, so one is not satisfied now, but let us make a big push for it. That, but that is, people must buy and agree that. Agriculture is not your small scale farming, in which you, you know when you're traveling from Lagos to Ibadan to Abuja, and you see the farmer with his hoe and cutlass going. No, that is, that is, not, the, that is not the agriculture we're talking about. We're talking about a new thing. And that's where the whole question of idea of agripreneur. Agripreneur also comes in. That is, agricultural entrepreneurship also comes in. So that's, that's, my, that's my brief answer, you know, as far as that question is concerned. But thank you very much, um, Ambassador. Uh, I'll go quickly to my next question. You know, as a Rihonda diplomat, um, what is your view about the African continental free trade area, you know, that has just been signed by Nigeria? and the impact this is going to have on the Nigerian agribusiness sector. Because um, if you look at our exports in um, 2019, you know, the non-oil you know, export grew to about 10.4 billion yeah. US dollars. I, I was very surprised and very excited. But when I checked the data um, in NBS um, statistics, I realized that there's something they call re-export. Re and that re-export, you know, is just about Nigeria importing goods, adding little value to it, and exporting it to other African countries. With this free trade uh, being signed, it is not going to allow, you know, other countries to just add little value to products, send it down to Nigeria because we have the market, and this could probably have a negative impact on the agribusiness sector generally. What is your take on this, sir? Well, uh, thank you very much. You've mentioned uh, the AFCTA, the African Free Trade Contract uh, Agreement, um, and I'm glad this is coming up. Um, when this whole process, and don't, don't let us forget that, if you backtrack, the vision of the African continental free trade area is a vision which did back to when our founding fathers established the OAU, and then fast forward to African Union, that we must scale up in terms of creating a huge market for Africa, uh, 
to improve inter-African trade as well, and also give opportunity to uh, members of uh, each, each country, remember. And of course, it was along the trend of what is going on, the European Union itself and all of that. Um, long story short, the vision you know, was achieved. July, um, Nigeria eventually signed because there was first fears. You know, people are always very afraid of new ideas. Um, it's like very much the whole question of, uh, I remember that the period in which television is said when it arrived, uh, there are some Christian groups and others who so, know this is the box of the devil. Do let us watch television. Um, today, the big churches and everybody is keyed into it. They have television stations. I'm saying that new ideas are always there. So we have the FCT now. So when the process started, there were fears in Nigeria because of the challenges and problems we have in terms of capacity production that our market will become, it's a huge market. Nigeria is a huge market. People outside say, and I serve as the diplomat outside, and I say, look, all you need to do is just to capture Agege area. Don't bother. The number of people there will make you rich. So that was the fair as far as that. But we said that there are advantages also, because what was left for us, and that's why, it was, why Nasima Ali keyed on to it. And we must confess that some, some of our members too are exercising fears. But there are others who are producing and saying that they're ready to start exporting to the African may take advantage of that. So, but thank God it was sorted out. Nigeria signed eventually July 7. And um, I want to mention the, 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 my colleague in the Foreign Service, Ambassador Chiedu Odasos, a queer of Bledes memory who passed away, who was also the Director General of the NOT, and also was involved in the discussions in Addis too as well. And, um, but we have this in our hands. It is now left for us to turn and see how can we benefit? How can our people benefit from it? And that is the, that is the spin. And that's why we have a dialogue series. And I want to make mention of this. Nasima had a dialogue series on the AFCT because a lot of people don't know what it is. The various section, it's a huge agreement. So many technical aspects. We held the first session, it was Nigeria, the FCT and the Nigerian private sector. The FCT and Nigeria, because it is a private sector people that will operate. It is not government that will trade. It is the private sector people. So we have to do that. Then we did another one, you know, trading goods. What does it mean? And then, of course, state of negotiation, we looked at it. We were preparing for services uh, when this thing started. And I want to quickly mention it so that I can round up and then we can continue. That we looked at it. It was left for us to identify the various areas where we have strength. There are areas where we are weak, but there are areas of strength as well. Look at the services sector. I told you I served in East Africa. I'm in, in Nairobi and some of those places. When I was serving 2000 and 2000, I mean 2000 and 2007, we didn't have a Nigerian bank in those places. Somewhere, some sign across the road. We have very many of our banks, they make big ones. I'm not advertising here to have a Zenit, we have a UBA. Nigerian banks are the ones that, this is, this is services sector, which is being dominated by Nigerian. And of course, it means the Nigerian banks and financial sector are already playing as far as the FCTA is as it's concerned. March last year, I think last year, early last year, there was the GAPS, the German African Business Summit. And I went as part of Nassima representative in that place. It coincided with the period the Ghanaians were recapitalizing their bank. You know what? It was the Nigerian banks about the level. Section of mediation and conciliation within the framework of the uh, AFCT. Some of the Nigerian leaders, we are ready to train you. The point I'm making is that already we are playing in it. The AFCTA is key, it is here. And then our SMEs too, as well. If you go across Africa now, you find many of Nigerian products. I was in Uganda the other day and I found the duos and a few of the Nigerian. And I said, This is from Nigeria. And they say, Yes, we but them, they're not saying that unfortunately we don't get enough supply. So we need more of your products. That is as far as agri is concerned, agricultural products itself is concerned. But how many people know this? So these are things which we should wake up to in terms of what exactly we should do. And now 
Let me round up with this as far as the AFCT is in itself is concerned. COVID-19 has driven everybody back into the house. So everybody's locking the doors, you know, so that this virus will not come in. And then, of course, so that what we produce will be enough for us to eat. We are now involved in a discussion, and I think we would like to revert whilst that. The idea is that please don't let us, because of the current security difficulties, forget the AFCT. Let us stay focused. And we are working on this already. There's going to be a webinar in that. Let us stay focused because it has been, it has been argued that indeed the AFCTA is one of the strategic options for African countries in terms of the efforts to reboost the economy. So this is, this is as far as the AFCT itself is concerned in context of our discussion. And, and I think it will help to boost and encourage our farmers that look, I can, I mean, look at, look at Orobo, look at some of the smell pool, look at, look, look at, look, look at our, uh, 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 look at our ginger, look, look, look at uh, uh, um, um, cashew nuts, look at uh, 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 zobo, I mean, which is uh, abiscus. All these are products. And I remember, and I know that because I was involved in it, in terms to resolve the crisis of Mexico, in terms of our, 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 our abiscus, as well as, the, as well as the question and issues of uh, our, 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 our cashew nuts to as well. So let us be forward looking as far as this is concerned. And I'm sure that definitely the current difficulties will not drive us out of there. That will be taking a wrong, a wrong decision. But in Nasima, we're staying focused as far as that is concerned, and we are working on a webinar very soon uh, to bring it to the attention of people in terms of the AFCT as one of the strategic options in our effort to reopen our economy and reboost the economy. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador, for that in-depth uh, um, discourse about the AFCTA. So uh, in, in 1957, um, Agriculture contributed about 65.7% to Nigeria's GDP, and today about 21.6%. With the oil boom in the early 70s, why wasn't it possible for us to develop the oil and agribusiness sector simultaneously to create at least a dual income economy for Nigeria? I think we missed that opportunity. Yeah, we, 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 we did. The question is that we caught what is, no, caught what is known as the Dutch disease. We caught, we caught the Dutch disease when oil came. And the Dutch disease, of course, like most of us know, is that, I mean, you do your, your resources, I mean, you, you, you have a resource like oil, and then which gives you a lot of foreign exchange, and then you, from there you abandon whatever you're doing and start importing. And you know, it was a period in which they said we had enough money, uh, the problem was to what to do with it. And we shouldn't, I mean, it was, it was a missed opportunity. And I guess what we earn from oil, we should have invested in the area of agriculture. We, should, we, we didn't need to have abandoned that. But oil prices moved from $3 to $40. And that's the, you're not talking of 100%. Calculate it. You will be shocked in terms of the amount of money. So that was a missed opportunity. It was possible for us to develop the oil sector along the line as we are also continuing. Because those days we were talking about was the days of the granite pyramid. We had cotton, we had cocoa. Um, we should have continued along those lines in terms of uh, that particular uh, development. I think that is what that's what should have. That's that's what we should have. Unfortunately, we missed the road as far as that is concerned. And all there was there was there was effort to struggle to when we discovered that you know when you're traveling, if you're traveling from Lagos to Adokuta or you're trying from here to Abuja, and you discover that um, rather than continue Lagos by the expressway, you are on the Lagos Badagri expressway heading for Kutonu. Um, when you get to Badagri, you will say, ah, I think I've missed the road, I should go back. We try to go back through initiatives such as Operation Feed the Nation yeah. under President Obasanjo. Then there are also other initiatives. But the crisis of sustainability was it we launched this initiative then suddenly went so so we just continue halfway when there are problems and then you know the 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 bust and the boom cycle of the oil industry when it is down we start crying agriculture let's go back to the farm 
then immediately it shoots up again. There was a time I think it went as far as hundred billion, hundred million. I mean, hundred hundred dollars, if you remember. And I think it also coincided the period of the Gulf War, so that once the money starts rolling again, we forget. So that's why the question and issues of sustainability, as far as agricultural initiative and sector, is key and very very important. We should not go back. This is what has happened now. You make mention of what exactly. It was possible, the question, it was possible for us to develop the two tracks as far as the oil industry itself is concerned and agriculture. And the fund we are making from the oil sector at that point, we should have poured into agriculture at that particular period. We will not be seeing it. But now it's never too late. I think this is lesson, we've learned lessons from that. And so I think it's necessarily good so that we can improve in terms of. And I think that's what I'm saying. I'm indeed glad and happy that the agricultural revolution in terms of, sorry, the, the rise revolution, which we have seen, um, has shown us it is possible for us to do this. And I sincerely hope that we will use this period to go back uh, to do that and improve the company in terms of production capacity of the agri sector with the active participation of the private sector. And also, somewhere along the line, I think we also need to look at the action at the subnational level, at the national, at the subnational, I'm talking about the states. How many states have coordinated and you know comprehensive roadmap in terms of development of agriculture in their respective states? How many? We must we must we must interrogate that. And it used to it's supposed to be a priority because all states of the federation are endowed. Even the states in the dry arid land, because I happen to have worked on the environment issue in context of the UN Convention on Desertification. And I know that the issue and of desert agriculture is key and very important. While serving in, 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 in Tel Aviv, there is the Institute of Desert Agriculture in a place they call Steboka. Steboka is in the Negev. Institute of Desert Agriculture in terms of how to use deep irrigation. And I know that state and a few other people send people to that particular institute to learn about desert agriculture. So if your state is on the border, of the desert, the Sahara, or the dry land. You can do a lot of work in that area. It was established by the late Ben-Gurion, and Zdeboka is his village. So the Institute for Desert Agriculture, and I'm sure there are other research stations across Nigeria. So that is an area we can look at, especially for states who are not endowed in terms of rain-fed agriculture. And I think that is, that is, that is an area which is, but what I'm saying is that I think the states must wake up to it. Or your state is there, the Institute of the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture is there. What is the relationship between RITA and the Oyo State Ministry of Agriculture? We need to find out. How can they take advantage of it with the various research stations? Bridging the gap between the town and Ghana, as far as that is concerned. Those are areas which I think we should look at too, especially at this particular period when we are thinking and pondering how to boost agricultural productivity. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. That was a deep insight because that is still um, going to lead me to my next question. Although as a quick one, um, I, the, the current um, um, executive advisor to the state government, uh, Mr. Debo, Dr. Debo Akonde, is, is an IITA staff, you know, and the governor of Oyo, I know specifically how to Ed Hunting to make him a special advisor. So I think, or your state in that context, they, they, I think they're about getting it right. So I, I would like us to go to this uh, next question because uh, this issue really bothers me because in 1960, Nigeria supplied about 50% of global palm kernel production. And by 1982, we became a net importer of oil palm, which is a misery. We are second in cocoa production in the 1960, ne just next to Ghana. And right now we are fifth position. And Cameroon, our neighbor, just recently outpaced us in terms of cocoa production. Cote d'Ivoire exports about 5.8 billion US dollars worth of cocoa in 2019. And Nigeria total agricultural pro, uh, export was less than $2 billion. So what exactly is responsible for all these downward trends? Because the same thing is happening with rubber, with granite, with cotton, and the rest of them. How do we begin to reverse this negative trend? Well, 
you know, it's not, it's not far from what we said, that uh, when you neglect uh, what is the, your strength, theory of strength, um, and then start, you know, going to oil, focusing on it, and then when all how that happens is most of the time, your commissioner of finance from the state, when they said the month is coming to go and share money uh, in Abuja, revenue mobilization, uh, they abandon everything and go there. This is, this is what you get. You've made mention of it. It is common knowledge. And then I think one of the, one of the stories, the cliche is that, oh, the Malaysian oil industry, uh, of course, the uh, palm oil industry came, was de developed on the, on the, on the, on, on the platform, on, on the shoulder of the Nigerian oil palm industry, especially NIFO, the Nigerian Institute for Oil Palm Research, which was established way back in the 30s. So if we had continued the project, the, 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 the trajectory, in terms of the oil palm sector, I mean, we will, of course, have gone ahead. We would not be in the position we are in now. But not only that, also look at the value chain as far as palm oil is concerned. It, you know, bleached palm oil comes back here from quote unquote granite white oil. Bleached palm oil. So, what happened to us as far as that is concerned? Um, I don't want us to weep over skill blame. You've made mention of it. Coco, we've fallen out of it. This we've fallen out of it. And I think we should go back to this place. And that's where the whole question and issues of let us encourage private sector to put more effort in this. People invest into this in that particular area. And that's and this is and this is one of the things we have to do in terms of this particular area. They're still key and very important because a lot has happened in terms of the value chain as far as coco is concerned. The value chain as far as oil is concerned, the value chain as far as cotton itself is concerned. And I'll give you a good example. Well, so as we are contesting it, Ghana, you've made mention of, they've, apart from helping to sustain the cocoa industry, they've also moved ahead with the value chain. And I understand when we were in, in, in Accra last year, and we were discussing the Ghanaian chocolate, which has been developed on that. I understand the market in Nigeria, when it's about $9 million worth of chocolate from Ghana chocolate you know, from the Ghana, from the from cocoa from Ghana that are produced and sold in the Nigerian market. I mean correct me if I'm wrong, that's what they said. So that means that we must look beyond the question of that. We must ramp up production, but don't let us just be henceforth now be exporting that. We must we must internalize the fact that we are not just want to export it. We want to produce it and produce it and then add value to it. It is common knowledge. They say that Kodo, I sat in Brussels, I know in those days, Kodo is one of the, you know, chocolate from, chocolate from Kodo. And of course, from France, in terms of what happens when they took those standards, how much do you get for a ton of cocoa? And then if you look at it, how much do you ten? You get 10 times for, even not, even not 50 times, in terms of what you get from chocolate. So in our efforts to revamp those sectors, let us look beyond the primary issues of production and exporting raw bean of cocoa or road being palm oil. A lot of our people now going. So I think that is, that is what we should look at in terms of say, okay, we want to go back, we want to improve rubber and things like that. We must move beyond ex exporting raw, raw cocoa, raw rubber or raw. And that's one of the things we're doing in Asiba now and working closely in this particular area. And let, let, let me give you an example, uh, uh, for example, of some of the things we are doing. Um, perhaps you must have heard of the Unsuka yellow pepper. I'm very fond of this because in the Unsuka yellow pepper is also similar to what they call maybe the Cameroonian pepper. You are in the field, you know this, and this is one of the things which are you know. And about 300 farmers are being coordinated by the Unsuka chimas because part of the problem is also there needs to be a professional approach to this thing in terms of farming. It's not, like I said, no longer the days of O and Cutlass. 300 farmers being coordinated by the Insuka Chambers of Commerce to develop the, the, the yellow pepper and also export target markets, Euro and the US, including the whole question of packaging. I do have a PowerPoint presentation, maybe somewhere, somewhere along the line, uh, maybe in, in, uh, when the opportunity comes, when we all meet after COVID-19 allows us to uh, hug ourselves and not just uh, you know, greet ourselves this way. The, the, the Chambers of Commerce in Zuzuka is working closely on it to develop 
this the Insuka yellow paper as an export because people are interested outside. I was just discussing with a group, a, a friend of mine in, 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 in Tel Aviv, in Israel, uh, about a few days ago, and linking them up because they say they are interested. And don't forget, there are sometimes people also have they've come, they, they've been here to help to develop some of these products for export. But the crisis and problem of non-professional approach to it is always part of the problem. So we have a very professional in terms of our export products, in terms of what we want to do. And that's why I was giving the example of uh, the Insuka yellow paper. And uh, of course, you've made mention that cocoa, rubber, it is no longer a question of exporting. We must add value. So that all those companies that produce, you know, uh, tires who left Nigeria can come back. Because in terms of the in terms in terms of the question of value, in terms of the question of the 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 the, the, the species, the type, we have the best of all of this. So this is this is what, and of course that goes on to the question of standard, uh, which of course we must uh, also I think as we will talk about in terms of uh, this um, because there is the gap, the global agricultural, uh, the, 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 the 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 gap initiative in terms of good agricultural practices good agricultural practices, which is part and parcel of the problem which we face. Because while outside, while I sat in New York in those days, and of course also when I sat in Austria as well, and they were importing some of the yams, part of the crisis and problem we have was we were not keeping to what I refer to as the good agricultural practice. We must put this into the roadmap, into the implementation arrangement as we get ourselves ready to, I mean, to, to, to enter into that task market. Because as, 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 as somebody who had, Australia was one of the, has one of the toughest biosafety laws in the world. Tough biosafety. But yes, give it to Nigerians. They even import yams. That means they ex we will export yams. But if you want to enter Australia with your product, honestly, you know better control. Yeah. I had an experience once. You cannot eat, you cannot take fruit from Sydney to Perth. Apple, oranges, if you have it, you, they will not allow it. That's how tough the biosafety laws. Final approach, the persons will come on board. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now approaching the Perth airport. Please, if Western Australia does not allow fruit into Western Australia, please either consume or do drop into the waste basket when the cabin staff are. And if you arrive, if you take there, and it's, it happened to me as ambassador to Australia. I was coming from New Zealand. And I forgot the fruits, I mean, the apple which I was e eating in the bag. I tired very early morning flights. By the time I allowed, uh, 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 came for Smith Airport in the morning, it was in my bag. And of course, when you arrive at the airport, the dogs will go around and sniff. The moment the dog sat beside my hand luggage, I said, this is trouble. Your Excellency, welcome. Can we please search your bag? Can we look into your bag? And they brought out the app. I forgot to tell you. Oh, thank you very much. Please, can you fill this form for us? Thank God for Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Immunity. Only God knows how much they will have taken out of my pocket that day. But the point I'm making is that this is, this is, this is, the, this is the new world we live in. So when we are going to export our production, our, our, our fruits and things like that, uh, uh, it must keep to the good agricultural practices. And I think this is something which Nasima is also involved in. We're doing training for our, for, our, for our people as far as this is concerned. Sorry, I took a little bit too long in answering those questions. Yeah, no, 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 not a problem, Ambassador. That was a vital question that needed a lot of uh, explanation. And um, that, that takes me to our next question, which is um, with oil currently accounting for more than 90% of our national export and 60% of government revenue. Without casting a spell, it is obvious from the recent crash in price of crude oil, you know, what is by this latest COVID-19, you know, that we are witnessing the last decade of relevance in terms of oil relevance, because most countries are going for cleaner sources of energy, renewable sources of energy. Honda, an automobile company, just said by 2022, they're going to completely stop the production of gasoline vehicles, and they're going to go. Um, and they're, going, they're going to start producing uh, green cars as from 2022. And with all of these challenges, and Nigeria over reliance on oil, what do we need to do very urgently? Because 
population by 2030 is going to go to something close to about 250 million. And we still stuck on oil. There is no replacement for the revenue. What is going to happen to Nigeria as a nation if we, if we don't really act very quickly and promptly? Well, uh, you know, thank you very much for that question. Um, I have a little, I have a little, uh, 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 it, 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 some views as far as these issues are concerned, a little bit different from, from you know, I sat, in Vienna, I sat in Vienna for about a year and I followed the OPEC proceedings. I was part of the delegation to OPEC. And um, I must tell you that indeed, um, despite the old issues of push to, re to reduce the carbon footprint, um, one way or the other, the, oils, the, crude oil, the, the oil industry will still continue to be relevant as far as that comes. And don't forget, because a lot of derivatives from oil, a lot of derivatives from oil, if not over close to over 150. Um, so don't let us say that, no, uh, 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 they will not continue to dig for oil. It will still continue. People will still continue to do that. The, is the use and what we do with it is what will, a little bit, will change a little bit as far as that is concerned. What is left for us to do is to reduce our dependence on this as our main force of foreign exchange because it will continue. I also was in Nairobi in Kenya and I, when I worked on the environment issue. My master's thesis was also on international environmental law. And I totally understand and the question of reducing of carbon footprint as far as the, and your question of sustainable development. Uh, um, you'll be shocked and surprised that even though now, um, you know, gasoline driven vehicles is one of the main sources in terms of the crude oil producers. And when people move and go on to plug their cars to electricity service circuit, then oil. No, I don't think I don't I don't think that I don't think that would be the end of oil. So don't let us forget that. Um, we have fertilizer from it. We are also a gas-driven nation too as well. And our gas component is part and parcel of our own crude oil ecosystem. Don't forget that. I think we are about the seven biggest as far as oil gas. There's a national master gas plan. Our liquefied natural gas project thing is very popular in the world. And I remember when effort was being made when I was in Australia, uh, the LNG. Uh, uh, uh. So this is, this is the totality of how we should look at it. And that while we make efforts to reduce our total dependence in terms of forex on oil, don't let us forget the other areas that are associated with the oil sector. Our gas is also one of it. Um, in terms of that is in terms of what that is concerned, and um, so this is one of the things. I we're looking forward to what will happen with the Dangote uh, 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 refinery in terms of because it's not only just uh, uh, PMS that will be produced you know, from that. Yes, um, we should we should we should have a PMS issue in our uh, the arrival of the electric cars, but let us also be very strategic in terms of because you never know science continues to evolve. Science continues to evolve. You never know what new product can come from the crude oil itself. There are very many others you know, for now. So this, this is my take on it. And like I said, as somebody who also worked in, uh, in Vienna and followed uh, closely the whole question and issues of the renewable energy, the, 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 the OPEC, uh, um, it continues to be a major part for the foreseeable future of, uh, the, of, of the global economy. Um, Why the boost and bomb and stumble? But let us develop other areas. Like I said, the gas thing, which you mentioned, the question of clean energy. The more we encourage people to use gas in terms of various sources of it, powered, power, I mean, um, gas fired station to produce electricity, um, it means that uh, implicitly um, we are diversifying our sources as far as the foreign exchange itself is concerned in this particular area. Because a lot of countries and others will continue to reach out to us in terms of uh, buying gas and other things uh, from us. Those, those, that's, I mean, Ban a little bit controversial, but like I said, we should look beyond the pump as well as the gas, uh, as well as cars itself is concerned, because there will be also other various uses as far as this is concerned. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Um, I'll quickly go to my next question. As the Director General of um, NASIMA, which is the number one advocacy voice for the organized private sector in Nigeria, uh, more so that um, your, your, your chamber covers commerce, 
it covers industry and it covers agriculture, which are integral part of agribusiness. Because just like we said earlier, agribusiness is about production, processing, distribution, logistics, sales. Yes. And, and and your 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 chamber seems to be kind of the best body in the country that kind of um, addresses the issue of commerce side of agribusiness, the industrial side of agribusiness, and then the agriculture not so side in itself. And I'll couple with your vast you know, exposure to the diploma that has traveled globally. Um, I, I, I want to ask, how should we begin to bridge the gap between our current state today and the future we hope to be? How do we begin to look at bridging the gap? What are the solutions for us to be able to move forward where we are currently into this desired position where we can begin to export and revamp the agribusiness agri sector to an equitable position that it could actually replace the revenue uh, forex, you know, from from oil that we currently at. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for that for that question. Um, for Nasima, and that's one of the reasons why we are, of course, uh, always at the forefront as far as advocacy issue is concerned. We should expand its space as far as the private sector itself is concerned, and that private sector, as far as that was even small small holders farmer too as well in terms of that. So states themselves can take it on their own to see how they can work closely with the chambers. And that's one of the things we are encouraging. Wherever we've been, wherever we go to, when we have our ESCO and council meeting, we invite the state governors, we invite the Minister of Agriculture in those days, and to introduce and link them up with members of the chambers who are in agriculture, who are in agriculture, so that they can see them as partners because it is key and very important to do that. If you don't do that, then we end up working in silos. So that, and I gave, like I said, I was just giving a good example of the Insuka Yellow Pepe. We're trying to connect, you know, the governor, Enugu State and others with these people. So that the governor itself, the government itself, maybe through a special purpose vehicle, can key into that particular area and invest in it. So that, so that, all those things which are going on, members themselves, the state government, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't like, I, I don't want to be abstract. What I'm saying, for example, look, look at the citrus zone in, 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 um, in, in, the, in the West, in the Southwest, Ibadan. You drive out of Ibadan, you drive on to Fiditi, Fiditi, all straight to Oyo, Oyo, all straight to Oyo. They talk about the Obama Shogun, we don't. So that the point is that it is, it is possible for the Oyo state government to have a special purpose vehicle agricultural company limited not not in the not in the ministry of agriculture not in the ministry of agri a limited liability company that want to invest i gave you the example of what happened as far as um, uh, 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 the 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 national uh, uh, kibbutz which used to export just orange itself that now went on to add value chain i mean add value to it by now producing canned fruit these are these kind of things which should be done now. A state like Benin, which is the food basket, look at, look, look, look at the, 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 the cashew nuts in the place, in the entire place. Is it not possible for Benin states to establish a limited liability company, not, not as a part of the Ministry of Agri in Benin states, but a, a, a company, and then work closely with the Benin states, the, the president of the Benin Chambers of Commerce is also into agri. And then so that they can walk through, you know, be able to inject, and they will, and they will, they will have bread, they will have funds and revenue from this particular agree, in terms of their investment. So the thing is, like I said, fundamentally, the mindset as far as agri as they are an agri business. And this is why I was talking about the whole question of agri initiative. Through the agri initiative, it is targeted at young people to see a Greek as a business, as an opportunity. And we have cases, because we work closely with IIT in this particular area, in which young people, even if you come out with BA Yoruba or BA uh, religious studies, it is possible that when you have BA religious study, the possibility is that please go and open your own church too as well, so that uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the faithful can come. But it is possible you, even as with your BA religious study, to also be an agripreneur. A large number of people are into fish farming. They dry the fish, they package it, they export it. So 
Initiatives such as this is important, the agripreneur initiative, targeting young people. And don't forget Nigeria is essentially a young population. Please go and look at next generation report, next generation Nigeria, which says that Nigeria's future does not lie not only in its oil, but in its youth, the demographic dividend. Demographic dividends, and that demographic dividends includes encouraging young people to go to become entrepreneurs. There is this initiative in the RIT. We are working closely with them. And I know that um, um, Dr. Aki, I think we will be I'm an additional uh, AFD president. Is, 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 this is a issue of the, is the heart of the matter for him, and also is a matter of the heart for him. And the building in RITA is named after him. And the business incubation platform, and I want to say this and as, as an information, the business incubation platform of the RITA is specifically looking at how to work with young people in terms of the agripreneur initiative to encourage them. Nasima is also involved in this particular area. We are working closely with RIT. If we can scale up all of this, this agripreneur initiative across the respective states, you can imagine the impact on productivity, the whole question of opportunity for young people to be able to key into the agripreneur uh, initiative. And of course, also not, to, I, I must not also forget the gender dimension of it in terms of uh, a large number of our women too as well, uh, who are also going to the agricultural uh, sector. So I think, I think this, this, uh, this, this is, these are the conversation we continue to have. And of course, uh, like I said, uh, the opportunity is there. We work closely in Nasima to help people to practicalize and walk the talk. That's why I'm indeed very glad that uh, uh, with WAS, uh, we are taking our relationship up to next level in terms of what uh, can be done. Just early today, we were discussing with our colleague from uh, uh, the uh, uh, Benin Chambers of Commerce, and we're talking about the question of agriculture within the respective chain between our two countries. And of course, uh, we know what exactly can be done in this particular area. So we stand ready to work with uh, stakeholders like you um, in this particular area so that we can have practical uh, impacts. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador, you know, for, for that insight. And also the privilege extended to us with in the issue of um, actually looking at being able to create an agribusiness ecosystem, okay, that ensures quality food sufficiency, safety, and security. Because one of my argument points, you know, is about food safety. You know, it's not just enough for us to be saying we want to export, you know, quality food out of the country. Why, why can't we give quality food to Nigerians? And I believe we need to also optimize production, our process, our processing capability, our market assets as well, our trade in export commodities. And of course, you mentioned the issue of adding value to them before export. And then so that we can diversify this economy and be able to enhance our foreign uh, exchange earnings. How do we create this kind of ecosystem? Because I, I did one of my thesis on the circular economy, which is one of the ways I was able to reform our current state whereby they build circular economy around clusters, you know, you know, manufacturing hub and all of that. So how do we begin to create an agribusiness ecosystem that can help us achieve all this? Well, thank you very much uh, for, for, for that question too as well. Um, I think we go back to this basic in terms of looking at our uh, commitment to ensure that indeed uh, uh, we must work to help in terms of improve the agricultural production. You've mentioned the question of the agricultural system. You mentioned food safety. Um, you mentioned the whole question of what we call market access. And all of these are within the framework of the new agric ecosystem generally, that is imagined. And that was why I said that indeed I made reference to the gap, the good agricultural you know, practices. It's an, in, it's an international initiative, which Nigeria, of course, is also gradually keeping into. There are various aspects of it. A short interview like this will not be enough. But people should please go and look at that. And that's why, of course, we also have the question of standard standardization, standard organization of Nigeria, the quarantine and all of that, in terms of creation of this. Actually, if you look at the green alternative too as well, you will find all of this in this. 
Um, which means that when we are encouraging our farmers to grow ugu, or we are encouraging our farmers to also grow a, 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 a cashew nut for export, we should remind them of the issue of quality. We should remind them of there is an international standard which they must keep to. That is key. That is very important. And like I said, if you remember, I think about two or three years ago, there was a farm fair who were exporting yam, you know, from uh, Nigeria. They say, I think from, I can't remember, maybe Bino. And then um, the story we heard was that uh, eventually the thing was not allowed in. So that means that's an international step. And as, and as an environmentalist who was also sat close four years in Nairobi, in Kenya, I have practical example which I can give. The flower cut industry in Kenya is one of the main area. They export cut in the, uh, flour from Kenya to Europe. Amsterdam is the destination. The KK201, because I also was involved in that, that leaves Nairobi in the night, arrives Amsterdam to meet the market. Suddenly, there was crisis because they, on, they said that the flower cut industry was not keeping up to the question of fine, fine, fight, fight, so sanitary laws and regulation. That what they were fleeting, that the European laws would not allow those cut flower industry to come into it. It was disastrous because it hit the industry bad. But quickly they adjusted to keep to those regulations in terms of what are the chemicals which should be used to be able to ensure that. So that is a good example of why we need to. Each day and each time, in, when I'm traveling, you see bales of ugu loaded into cars. And you know, our women are indeed, I must give two thumbs to them. They are also loaded. The driver is there. The ugu is in between the driver and the madam who is the owner of ugu. They are all loaded together. And, and I said, they're taking them to market in this state. How can we, how can we succeed in this area as far as that is concerned? So that's one issue in terms of good agricultural practices if you want to add an export market. We had an initiative one that are women who are involved in the cooperative producing a ugu, and we told them when they came, they said they wanted to start exporting, there was somebody who was helping them, and then they had problems, so they came to Nasima, and we asked them. And I personally went to look for them, and I saw the lady, and I saw the state, I said, Madam, with this kind of situation where you are, in which you are loaded into the vehicle, those are they're loading the ugu and half of it, there's no way you will access the market. So that is another issue in terms of capacitating those of our people and helping them. And that's one of the areas which Nasima is looking at in terms of we are working with an outfit, NISAT, in this particular area, to train people in this area. That is one issue in terms of, and also it crosses with the question of food safety. I mean, look at how we produce, look at how we sell our meat. One thing that struck me when I first arrived in Nairobi was that if you want to sell meat, you are in clean uniform, white. It is not on the table, it is in a glass. If you go to the market here, the Baba uh, Ilaron who is selling you is struggling and, you know, throwing, uh, fighting with the flies that are, that are patching you know, here. Either you want to buy the lamp or what. I mean, I mean, for God's sake, we must improve on this. And this is why we say that. And this is why the public-private partnership with our respective states comes in. That's as far as it. And then we are going on to a new ecosystem. I would like to mention it closely in terms of the digital and technological application into agriculture. We now have apps that have been developed. This is my phone. It is possible for you to have an app in terms of an, your agricultural business for people to be able to do agriculture, to help farm takers. It is not compulsory that the farmers, the farmer themselves, must be the one who should market. We, we, we must make sure we pay good for them. Now. So it is possible for us to use the digital, new digital ecosystem to improve agricultural production and entire value chain from area of production, from the area of the question of marketing. You're talking about market access. Nasima is developing something in this particular area as far as market access is concerned. And I think I will crave your indulgence. Whilst you should please look at me, we can talk about that. In terms of market access, because if you have product, what we've done is to 
identify the members of the chambers who produce what and what and what and what. And those people who, of course, want things from them. That is part of the American taxes in jail. And you can also, you know, I'm, I'm sure you are aware of the farm crowding initiative. The farm crowding initiative in which you can attract funds into farming, into your farm. You don't have to be a farmer to participate in the agribusiness. This is part of the new ecosystem as far as digital application and technological application of farming, or of the farm itself is concerned. And I know that um, there are very many platforms. There is crowdfunding you know, itself in Nigeria as a platform. There are also a few others who are also using the new digital application and technology to advance agricultural production. And of course, the entire value chain are in our in country. This, 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 these are just the new areas which are, of course, uh, opening up as far as um, our new, new, new environment itself is, is concerned. That means implicitly digital application of IT technology into farming itself. Not only just the question of application of farming itself, of course, you know, technology is also in there, but also market. A good example, when I went to the farm, in, in, in this, I was giving a good example that indeed, you now have the digital application of technology in terms of one, between the research station, the volcanic center, it is, it is one of the islands. We also have very many, very many agricultural outfits in here. Drip irrigation system, application to farming, in which there's even computerization process, in which the orange tree will ask the computer, please give me more water. And the water will be released to the farm, released to the farm. When it is enough, they say, it's enough. So this is, this, is, this is the new frontier which we all are in terms of uh, IT technology application to agricultural production and of course the entire value chain. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador. Actually, you begin to dive into my, you know, my, my next question, you know, uh, you know, style. Because the next question is about how, how do we actually create a knowledge driven agribusiness? You know that can thrive in this era of digital economy, and you know you know we are in now we're now in the fourth industrial revolution, and how can we begin to build human capacity? You know to create and utilize all these innovative ag tech solutions to be able to optimize our agribusiness development. It, it's good enough you mentioned um, the initiatives like that of farm crowding. I know of also uh, tribe and Greek. I, I know. Some quite a number of people trying to do some marketplaces like Food Locker and the rest of them. But then, how do we begin to actually create this local, you know, knowledge, local content, local knowledge, local application of our know-how to our problem, and attend to small-scale farmer needs, you know, so that we can begin to actually apply innovation to drive and optimize agribusiness sector. Well, thank you very much. You know, uh, I, I, it's always good to concretize the abstraction, to use some of our cliche building. There's the University of Agriculture in Abeokuta there. University of University in, in, in UNAM, University of Agriculture, you know. And I have colleagues who work in those places. You'll be amazed at the number and array of uh, initiative, scientific research that have been conducted in those places. How we must bridge the gap between Tan and Gao. We, we, we don't have to also, you know, we don't need to go all the way to China to go and bring what exactly they are doing and things like that. There are a lot of initiative, a lot of scientific research and IT. Enough. So one, the first thing I must say that, let us reach out to our respective, don't let us, don't let us, dis, I mean, disabuse them. Don't let us just disregard them. Between our respective university, faculty of agriculture, let us find a linkage. The whole question of all idea of farm extension. I went to the great Ife, and I, one of these days recently, um, while I was in Australia, I was able to secure some funding and look into agri and mining because Nigeria is also, um, we, have, we have a lot of mining potential, but we are not a mining nation yet. So the research was carried out and it was done at the teaching and research farm of the University of Ife. And I went physically to that farm along with the Australian High Commissioner 
at that time. I was amazed at what I found. Professor Sholajai happens to be the director of the farm at that particular period. And I was surprised at the level of technology innovation on the farm. So much so that new products, seedlings and others, were introduced on that farm. Drip irrigation system, watermelon, the amount of watermelon which is going out. I, I was in IFE 75, 79. You know, I'm an old man, you know, old generation of IFE 75, 79. Um, even though I go in and out from the campus, you know, from time to time. But I haven't been on the campus for a long time until I went to inspect, I went to that farm. And I was amazed. Then I asked him, I said, look, uh, uh, can't you produce enough? He said, yes, they can, but they need some small little of one addition. But what have, how much have you taken this outside from the gates of Ife to the farming community? What is your relationship between the, or your, the, between the Ocean State Ministry of Agriculture to replicate what you are doing? So a lot of those researches that are going on, should not just be left in the, in, the, in the classroom or on the shelf. We must take them outside. Farm extension. Let us go and do that. And that's why, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm invited. I'm, I'm glad. I think I went to Abuja the other time, and I saw a lot that is going on in the agricultural sector um, using uh, you know, um, uh, um, um, greenhouses. In it. Because I mean, as, as, as popular as greenhouses, what is the, what is the popularity ratio? How much greenhouses do you have amongst our farmers in terms of people, young people? So we have, to, we have to scale this up. This is very important. Let us bridge the gap between town and ground. Our respective research institutions and all of that. IIT, like I said, new seedlings, they have a gen bank. Um, we must take all of these out beyond the compass. If you go to IIT, for example, um, you know, you know the difference between Ojo and IIT. You think you are in a different country, you know, all, all together. Before even the way you behave and drive on the place, you yourself, you behave yourself. You think you are outside the country, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that means, uh, uh, you know, Europe or America has been created within Ibadan. Yeah. Uh, let us take outside. And that's why Nasima is closely involved with IIT. In this. We must replicate this outside. And see what we can do. You know, that is, I think that is that is the way. There's no, there's no, there's no sin, there's no magic bullet to it. We must walk the talk. We must make sure and also get our respective research institutions and others to also be part and parcel of this and take them outside. And of course, once you know, there is the common agricultural development outfits like yours can also work closely with us in terms of initiative which we have within our sub region. If there are good ideas in some other places and nobody is a reciprocity of all knowledge, let us see it. Let us have it. Let us see how we can replicate it uh, uh, in here. Uh, nobody is fighting for any ideas, ideological ideas in the heads of everybody. We are working for a better world. Make sure that Agric, of course, does what it's supposed to do in terms of food security as well as uh, well-being of our people. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, I, because of time, because uh, this is 3.15 uh, p.m. already, I'll just go straight to our, our last question and then we go straight into the question and answer question. Um, the last question for you today is on uh, the strategies uh, uh, and competencies that is needed by agribusiness actors for them to be able to redefine their activities, adapt to the current realities, and also build resilience into their business model during this COVID-19 pandemic and post-COVID-19 pandemic, what should entrepreneurs, agripreneurs, agribusiness actors, what should they be doing to be able to build those competencies and resilience into their business right now? Well, I, I think the number one thing is, like I said, to look at a Greek as a business. That is key. And when you look at it as a business, as a profitable business, then you have to make sure that you must professionalize the sector. We must professionalize the sector. Even if you're a small scale farmer or whatever it is, if you're in poultry or whatever it is, we must professionalize it. It is necessary for them to do that. That is the key and very important aspect of it. And like I said, if you were not reinventing the wheel, we've been there, what is left for us to now uh, you know, emerge as a new, the new, the new frontiers and make it a professional. Let me give you an example of you know, of what my experience was. 
I was also High Commissioner to Australia. I also had concurrent accreditation to New Zealand, Fiji, and Papua New Guinea. And when I was going to present my credentials in New Zealand, they had put onto my itinerary for me to visit, uh, 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 you know, a farm where they produce a milk, a milk producing, uh, a, a small little farm where cattle produce milk property in that particular area. And I was shocked at what I saw. I think that particular farm just had about maybe 20 cows, you know, in the place producing. It was professional, technologically driven, and just about five people operating the farm. And I was in the place at the period when they were milking the cow and then also packaging it. And they did it in such a way that within an hour, when they finished, the, the truck that was going to take the milk was coming in to take the milk. And you know what? They were taking the milk up to Auckland, where one of the companies who happened to supply Nigerian milk factory uh, with dried milk. Small little operation that that, but professional, technologically driven, clean in accordance with internationally accepted standard. I'm not saying we will get there overnight, but let us gradually start this. Lagos State Government, for example, has a coconut authority. Efforts are on to scale up in this particular area. This is an area, during the event which you held, I think they came, and I think it was quite interesting that. But how much is that? There was a time I went to see, visit the Avia farm on the road to Padagri. I mean, I was, I mean, it's, it's, you almost shed tears, which was open in the days of Marwa, Avia farm, in which women are producing, they call it the Wapagari. The farm was dead. The machines had broken down. So the whole question and idea of sustainability of the agribusiness as an agribusiness is key and very important as far as this is concerned. So this is, this is, this is very important. And I think um, even in the poultry area, as far as poultry itself is concerned, um, I was discussing this morning and then there was the question and issues of uh, during the lockdown, the loss in the poultry sector. It was simply because there was, there was no, there was no agricultural product value chain as far as that is concerned. So a lot of the, and, and the end does not know that it's lockdown. It continues to, you know, yield eggs. And then they had to now be burying those eggs. This is a wake up call for us. We should live up to it as far as that is concerned. And I think that is why before we leave, that I will invite our attention especially to the Nigerian Economic Sustainability Plan. It is key, it is very important, because as part of effort to reboot the economy and come reopen, that plan is there. It was produced by the committee set up by Mr. President and then with press, Vice President. The Nigerian economic, ec the economic Sustainability Plan, go and look at the section of that report. Food for all, agriculture and food safety. The project, there's a project under it, which will cover a period of two months. It is intent to expand production in the agricultural sector and stimulate the establishment of new farms. I'm reading, in partnership with state government. Five billion jobs is expected so for citizens. State government are supposed to cultivate 200,000 hectares. It will span the entire agricultural value chain from farm to the table. It will support smallholders. Increase production, and then also the objective is to create five million, and it is estimated that about six thirty-four billion naira will be attached to it. Please let us go and look at that economic sustainability plan. It is very important, but the most important aspect of implementation, implementation, implementation of that particular plan, and of course the beauty of it is that as Nasima we are standing up to it in terms of arguing and advocating that. The bulk of this should be implemented through the private sector. And that's why, of course, it is also a key and very important. And of course, I have the going for growth five-year policy thrust of the Central Bank of Nigeria. It is still relevant, 2019, 2004. And if you look at section of it, it talks about you know, targeted development finance and boost production and growth through provision of improved seedlings 
as well as access to finance for rural farmers in 10 different, I call 10 different commodities. Rice, maize, cassava, cocoa, tomato, cotton, oil palm, poultry, fish, and livestock and dairy. These are areas because it's good to also look at our areas of strength and work on it. So I, 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 will, I, will, I will crave indulgence of everybody to please kindly refer to this document too as well, uh, because you we'll need a roadmap in terms of our objective of um, agricultural productivities in line with me. And like I said to also, also, of course, it's not only food for the table, potentials in terms of export is there. I've seen it, I know it, I work outside. You know, and, and, and people come to the mission and say, I mean, in Australia, one of those days when people come for visa and I tell them, please, I'd like to see those people who are away. And about two, about two or three, I can't remember many of them, Australians came for visa. What were they doing? They were going to Cano to go and buy leather in Cano. And here, what was that? The Nigerian High Commissioner, I can't remember when last, uh, in terms of the can the Kano driving and the leather from Kano in those days. And I asked them, are you sure? They said, yes, this is what we've been doing for the past three, four years. Buying leather from Kano. Subsequently, and I'm close to about $5 million. In, you know, and when I now became DG Nasima, we held our AGM in Kano. And one of the areas we told was one of those leather producing leather, which is part of our. And then we were asking questions. We found somebody there, if young Spanish man, what is up to do is to make sure that the leather is clean. I think sheep and goat's leather, fine leather are produced and then sent out to Spain to come back as shoes and leather for uh, you know, our women. And I'm sure Mrs. Ladipo is listening knows that, you know, in those parties when you carry the bag and the shoe is matching, uh, it's, it's, it's Gucci, it is uh, Chanel. So can you imagine leather from Canada going back out to Europe and coming back as well? So these are, these, these are things which I think, and the question was, you know, look, we want to prepare. And look at, you can, you can connect the Abba garment and textile industry and see which they produce with an outfit that produces this. And then we have, of course, the National Livestock Plan too as well. Maybe perhaps we will focus, sectoral focus on some of these areas next time around. This, this, these are just some of the things which I think I have to uh, as, we, as we round up. But thank you very much. Of course, we can talk from now to tomorrow morning. We may not finish, but let us keep the conversation on uh, in terms of what areas we can. Uh, we are also we're always here in Nasima to work closely with outfits like yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. I quite appreciate your you know, deep explanation into most of the burning areas you know that most of our audience would, would very much love to listen to and uh, because of time constraint i would want us to quickly just uh, take some of the questions uh, that we have here um i'll start off by um also looking at um, a question from somebody that um actually wants to know more about nasema uh, there is daniel bello um, he's saying um, how do you become a member of NASIMA. In what way can NASIMA help with the huge problems of infrastructure, financing, technology, insurance, etc.? Uh, those, those are the concerns from Daniel Bello. You can just quickly take on that. Well, thank you very much. Um, we're out there. Um, I think the easiest to reach out to us is through our website. NASIMA is the, Niger the National Nigerian Association of Chambers of Commerce, Industry, Mines, and Agriculture. the premier national Association of Chambers of Commerce, working in four areas, commerce, industry, mines, and agriculture. And for me, it's key and very important. So you can go onto our website, send us an email in terms of your membership. Um, it is open to companies. I mean, it is, it is not an individual. I mean, you have to be running a business to be able to be a member of the chambers. There are conditions for that. And pop us an email in terms of that. And in terms of, we work closely uh, with uh, other chambers, you know, across across the, across across the nation, and we also have bilateral because we are composed of city chambers, state bilateral chambers. I mean, take for example, Nigerian American Chambers of Commerce, Nigerian South African Chambers of Commerce. Uh, they're all members of NASIMA. Take for example, the Italian Nigerian Italian Chambers in Italy that trying to join the part to establish Chambers of Commerce in this particular area. Now, LCCI, for example, which is well known, 
is we were established in 1960, and of course we've been there as an advocacy group. We work closely with government. Um, so please go to our website. Um, we also, of course, on I mean Twitter, Facebook, and all of them. Uh, this is the digital uh, media, uh, social media age, um, and it is an open house. Um, please, you can find that. Uh, although we are not, we are all skeletal work now, no visits now, but we can talk together. Send us an email in terms of. And we're also conducting training. I mean, I'll give you an example. We are, work, uh, we are we recently, and uh, we are starting a, pro, uh, a program on hydroponics. Hydroponics, like you know, of course, that is your own area you feel in terms of farming without soil. It's a new area that even if you live in Manhattan, on the 38th or 44th floor in Manhattan, you can even practice some form of agriculture. Even if it's on green pepper and tomatoes, you can grow using hydroponics. We have shifted a large number of our training online. And of course, you can of course reach out to us as far as this is concerned. We are talking with each other now. Some of those training, of course, is on. Presently, of course, most are free, but uh, you know, we've got to pay our bills. Uh, in terms of payment for the uh, internet and others, uh, we, will, we, will, we may charge, start, we will start charging uh, 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 token, token fees. The one we had with Africa House, and it was connected through from ground. Um, you can see what exactly is happening in this area in terms of the immense possibility. Um, so, Nazima is the place to be. Please join us, come to us, and be part and parcel of this. It's a free area. That's to answer that question quickly. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador. Um, my next question I'll take from uh, Mr. Belo Abdullahi, although I think you've answered that question you know, in the course of our discussion. The question is, uh, um, Mr. Ambassador, sir, how do you see um, how Nigerian government can recruit agricultural extension service agents to teach our rural farmers modern farming technology so that they can consider agriculture as a business and not as an heritage, I think um, that. Yeah, yes, but, but, but let me let me give you a practical example of what you know, to give him an example. The person who I mean. we were right. approached by somebody in Africa House. I think he lives somewhere in the Middle East, and he said, "Look, listen, Ambassador, we can work with you online and do training." So we are starting that now. So whatever you have, this is agricultural extension online now. Online agricultural extension in terms of the ideas. So it is possible to use this medium and um, we'll simply connect the expert, they will speak to us. Those people who are interested will signify they're interested in this area. We're talking about the question of export next time around with Africa House in terms of export of Nigerian agricultural products. What do we need to keep in mind as far as that is concerned? And there are new agricultural techniques. So this is, this is one of the ways we can use agricultural extension. We can expand agricultural intention. And like I said, it's an online world now, you know, so we can also supplement uh, through this medium and carrying out agricultural extension training uh, through online uh, uh, medium. You know, and of course, eventually, when you want to start, there's no virtual tomato. I do think there's, I do think there's <laughs> virtual yam. When you want pounded yam and you want to do pounded yam, you have to pound the yam inside the butter. And, uh, but that's just on the lighter note. Uh, what I'm saying is that we can take advantage of digital technology. Uh, to be able to do some training. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, my next question is from an anonymous uh, attendee. He said, um, I tried doing export into UK, but unfortunately the price of export was suicidal and very discouraging. What is your kind of advice on this? Uh, and to buttress this point, uh, Mr. Ambassador, sir, I know um, there is this uh, EUR1, you know, the, 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 the certificate that you, know, you need to get if you're exporting to the EU. And there's a, there's a kind of a treaty between the EU and, some yeah. country, and Nigeria is not a signatory to that. To, to, to that I'm, um, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very much aware of what, we, what, what, what you're saying. I mean, and it's a pity, you know, with a large number of Nigerian community. Uh, it goes back to mind when Guinness, one of the staff was trying to come into England because of number of, you know, uh, it took them a long time. You know, but it's not and to be able to enter the UK market. The question of certification of our product, of our product is, is an ongoing thing. We had problems, like I said, with Mexico, and we're trying to respond. Um, I, would, I, would, I would strongly recommend to that person to please join the NEG. The NEG is the Nasima Export Group. I was just discussing it. The NEG, 
and we are working closely with some outfit out there now to be able to take advantage of the opportunities happening. So the NEG will help. What we do is to guide our members in terms because a lot of people don't know regulations and others. So you need to come and learn and know what exactly is happening. So come to NEG. Then in addition, we're starting a training program with NISAT. NISAT is Nigerian Certification Outfit that is training. We were supposed to even have fiscal meetings and training before this lockdown. But we're not shifting this training online. And please, you can pop us an email. Go online to see our email. You can make reference to this. You can also, of course, link up with Mr. Asunuga and um, Mrs. Ladipo. Um, send an email to them uh, that they want you to link them up so that we can invite you uh, to the NEC, be part of it, and also some of the things we're talking about in terms of what exam. We are working closely with you know, the government agencies because the question of certification is uh, the EU, I totally agree with you. We are engaging with them. The EU uh, uh, delegate had visited Nasima in the past, and he came here physically before the COVID-19. That was sometimes last year. That we want to work with you to facilitate and provide opportunity for your members to access all of this. And so we are engaged with the EU in discussion with them to ensure that. And of course, you know, government has to. Uh, and of course, the whole question of gap is also involved in all of this. But we are engaged with them so that they can open the gate. Nigeria, Nigeria is the place. I mean, as a, as a former diplomat, I can tell you, either you like it or not, as a Nigerian or as Nigeria, they will call on you. You have to rise to the occasion. There's, there's no, there's no, you know, I, I was in Australia once. I was at a reception. A medical doctor who runs this chain of clinic said that, yes, I understand you're the Nigerian High Commission. I said, yes. He said, I run a chain of clinic and hospitals in Australia. Please, I need more Nigerian doctors. I look at him. He said, I have 12. I said, what do you want to do with Nigerian doctors again? He said, because they are the mainstay of my hospitals across Australia. And he ended up by saying, and the Nigerian doctors have the best bedside manner. Let me repeat that. They said the Nigerian doctors have the best bedside manner. When I was discussing with Nigerian doctors in Cambria and others, he said, ah, Oga Ambassador, he said the man does not know that uh, where we are coming from, we use hurricane lantern to look for veins. So <laughs> when we reach here and we see machine that can look for veins for us, ah, it is easy. Um, what I'm saying is that this is, this is us, this is our country, this is the potential, and we show. Western Australia, 2.5 million people, two, two, one person by one square kilometer. One person in Western Australia. One person. There are over 100 doctors in Perth alone. When I served in Nairobi, I was also, you know, uh, covering seashells. Three hours, five minutes. The chief agronomist for the agricultural sector was a Nigerian TAC volunteers. He's not a professor. He's also a TAC, you know, technical aid cost scheme volunteers. That is the potential of our, and the greatest resources you can have is human resources, in addition to what God has given us. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Ambassador. And uh, I'll take um, this next question from Ruti Miyosho. He said, um, Your Excellency, what is Nasima doing to develop and strengthen chambers of commerce and industry in various states in Nigeria? Well, thank you very much. That's a direct question. If it is, I mean, maybe my one wrote to me who might know, <laughs> you know. It's, um, recently, we held what is called the first virtual meeting of DGs and executive directors. It's an idea which is part of our medium term strategy to strengthen the chambers. Because the chambers can function properly when you have a properly functioning executive. So when COVID decided that no, it's going to COVID said it's going to close the road and close the airport, we shifted online and had the first virtual meeting of DGs and executive secretary of chambers. It was a very successful one. Many members of DGs and executive chambers came, asked questions, and we adopted an outcome document. One of the ways is to continuously relate with each other. And let people know the new frontiers as far as the chambers movement and chambers activities concerned. The new trend now is a co-prosperity. Like there is no way you can use your chamber to climb up and make money and forget poor people who are around you or the farmers in your area. The idea of co-prosperity in terms of the chamber. So members of chambers will be up to it in terms of what does it mean to run a chamber? How do you capacitate your chamber? 
How can you be running a chamber these days you say you don't have internet? How can you be running the chambers you don't have a website? You are a chamber in one of the mining states, Kogi or Nasara or Nida, and you want to attract mining investors to your area, and you don't have a website. These are the ways in which we are capacitating chambers. And the secretariat is key and very important. You know, having served in three of the UN headquarters, I know that the UN secretariats in all the places are very powerful. And there are UN ideas. It is UN ideas that change the world. Discussion on climate change, the whole question of gender and development issues. Don't forget the rural, better life for rural women idea came from the International Conference on women and development, which was held in 1985 in Nairobi, which adopted the Nairobi forward-looking strategy for the advancement of women. The UN Platform for Action Declaration, the Beijing Climate Declaration, was, was also an idea. So the point I'm making is that our respective Secretariat of the Chambers is the fulcrum for these ideas and is need to capacitate them. And that's the way we can strengthen the respective Chambers. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. I will take this next question from uh, Dina Eze. Uh, she, uh, she says, uh, most times there's always well-written plans, but the problem remains putting plans to work. Execution of plans never gets to see the light of the day, e.g. the economic sustainability plan. How do we ensure we follow through to completion on most of these plans? Well, thank you very much. I think the first thing to do is to know that there is something like economic sustainability plan. It is not to just read it in the newspaper, because the newspaper will just give you two or three paragraphs. And then you don't know the, you see, like I said, the devil is always in the detail, the nitty gritty. So people, in terms, in context of implementation, people need to, who are interested, on the, who are in the agricultural sector or whatever it is, is an interest, please go and get a copy of the economic sustainability plan. It is what you know, when you know it, it is then you will now be able to take on those people. There are supposed to be, in terms of a company sustainability plan, ministries are supposed to set up uh, implementing agencies. We are going to be engaged, of course, with the Minister of Industry, Mines, and Agriculture, and this Minister of Investment, and Trade and Investment recently. The, that plan is one of our reference points that we want to be part of the eight. We know 623 billion had been, of course, allocated to it in terms of, in terms of implementation. So we must familiarize ourselves with it, and then also be able to, within the framework of maybe our, our Greek cooperatives, maybe through our chambers, if you are members of the chambers, um, to make them. Because under the plan, implementation plan is key. And three issues are key, implementation, implementation, implementation. Because no matter how brilliant the ideas, you write it down, you don't implement, you just get us dust. So this is one of the strategies uh, which we want to adopt in terms of ensuring that this implementation uh, plan is, we're not just going to keep quiet about it. We're engaging the minister. And I, like I said, we have a meeting with online minister with the Minister of Trade and Investment uh, on this issue at the tower. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. I, I'm sure that speaks to the concern of uh, Dina Eze. I'll go straight to the next question from Obasi. Um, he says, the critical role of government is or governance in encouraging sustainable development and the necessity of drastic reduction of waste in agricultural processes, commodities, manpower, and capital investment into agribusinesses. I think that, that, that's the question. He said the critical roles, what is the critical, what are the critical roles of government, of governance in encouraging sustainable development in agriculture? Well, the, the, the government's issues span the entire, you know, development space. And of course, it's key. It's very important. Um, if you don't have, even as a chambers, if you don't have good structure as far as governance is concerned, you will just see president of chambers come and go. And there may be, and you know, there's a way in which uh, chambers is attractive. Uh, everybody's standing chambers now. Maybe the governor himself will say, ah, the chambers in, uh, in uh, Idioro Street, Idioro Chamber is there, and then they will say they're brought in the private sector. Um, that's why we are encouraging and ensuring and saying that look, there must be a proper government. NASIMA itself has to go through an accreditation process to ensure that our governance process is internationally recognized. So we have what we call the accreditation uh, program. What is our elections held regularly? What about communication equipment? The whole question of staff of the secretariat? 
the whole question of it is not just that a few people will do election, you know, because there are some people are saying that like, okay, with COVID, we can't do election. We said, no, you must go and do election, even if you want to do election online. So the governance issue is key and very important in the context of sustainability. The question in terms of the person, it permeates all aspects of our lives, and it's key and very important that you have a governance structure. It's not just a one man thing. That is key, that is the number one question as far as that is concerned. And of course, um, the whole question of sustainable development itself, you know, don't forget that uh, there are three pillars in terms of economic, social, as well as the, the social aspect of it too, as well, and environmental protection in terms of it. So what we've done is to subject ourselves to a peer, re peer review mechanism in Nasima. Then we can now hold on and tell all our chambers, please ensure your governance structure is key and very important. Your president of chambers cannot just take a decision on his own without consulting the members. There are processes and procedures. This is what governance is all about. And it's also, of course, is key and very important at the national level. And uh, of course, I'm sure you've seen it in terms of the whole process of dealing with uh, COVID itself. Um, the government just, and all, all the respective state government cannot just wake up and say, no, they had in place committee that keeps to those rules in terms of economy. So when they say they will do lockdown, they will know that they've gone through the process and they've thought about it. And of course, the issues have been considered properly within the framework of a particular rules and regulation. I think, I think, I think, I think, I think that is, that is my, uh, it's a wide question, but I think that is my quick response as far as that is concerned. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Um, there is a uh, Belo Abdullahi, I think, I can see three questions from him, in different uh, strides. He talked about the possibility of reversing the marketing board uh, to be able to boost uh, rural economy. He also talked about um, how can the government establish uh, processing centers uh, for meat, uh, maybe meat slaughter, um, so that transportation of meat from, uh, and then maybe abattoir, setting up abattoir, setting up yeah. dairy yeah. farms and what have you so that meat is not transported all the way from the north you know, down to the south, that this could help improve on uh, quality and, uh, of meat that, that has been consumed by co consumers. And then we also yeah. talk about, uh, uh, I think he's a, he's a student from maybe New Zaria. Um, he said, what is government doing to encourage uh, agricultural students? Uh, that he's seen a lot done for medical and law students that you know, they need to also motivate you know, uh, students of agriculture. So I think those are the three questions you can find from me. Well, well, thank you very much. Let me start quickly with the, with the last question, agricultural student. I, had, I don't know whether it was here when I was speaking about the Agripreneur Initiative. Um, and I think it is possible because one of the things is that they're taking this onto the campuses too as well, in terms of encouraging students who are in this area. The, Agri, the Agripreneur Initiative, so that when you are in the Agri department, you start thinking that when you eventually you come out, you're going to start as a, you're going to work as an agripreneur, looking at agri as, press, I mean, I, 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 as business. That is key because our universities are very useful at recruiting ground. And I think in the curriculum, efforts and steps are on in this particular. So as an agri student, if you remember and know there is IIT, a business innovation platform, already you calculate in your mind how to see, because a large number of people who are working in IIT, agri, agri uh, 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 the agripreneur system are, are even members of are, are doing their youth service there, so it is possible for you to do that from the from the, from the, from, the, from, the uh, uh, from the campus while you are there as an agri student. And of course, it is something which, of course, also I think the Ministry of Agriculture has an element. If you go onto the website in terms of young farmers and others, that is that's as far as that is concerned. They've made mention of the meat. You know, there is a national livestock and agricultural uh, uh, agri uh, national livestock uh, production uh, uh, plan. Please, yeah. if people don't, yes, you are aware of it. Please, um, we were involved in it. It is a brilliant farm. It's a brilliant plan because, unfortunately, the meat. I mean, our our our, our both our poultry as well as um, uh, meat and you know uh, uh, sector. Uh, if if you remember, we had the. Bauchi Kani Meat Company, way back, unfortunately, it collapsed. The Bauchi Kani Meat. So there is an attempt to revamp it now. But we are saying that, look, it should not be a government affair. The National Livestock 
uh, please um, uh, 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 the livestock uh, 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 plan is there in terms of what exactly can be done. Unfortunately, I think the Ruga, you know, the, this debate about the Ruga, Ruga, Ruga uh, farm thing, uh, cloud, be clouded it um, until it was, re it was represented. That look, listen, nobody is taking your farm and saying you must fall, people don't do that. So that, that is, that is the, it's a very useful framework. And very few people look at it from the hoops of our cattle to the cow heights and all of that. I don't think we, I don't think we use, we do, apart from you know, how many percentage of it. So that is a big area which we'll look at. And of course, I crave indulgence of people who are interested to look at that, like the National Livestock uh, uh, Plan. It is, it is key, it is very important. Let us look at it. Then of course, I think there was a, um, the question, because I know that we are, um, the processing culture, there, there was a question about the marketing boards. Uh, those who are of the old, will the marketing boards work now? I, I doubt it. What we have now is the new arena in terms of off takers itself. Um, because the idea of the marketing boards brings in government setting up marketing boards, applying, you know, there again. When we are talking about the private and government is saying, no, we don't want to be in business. It is not our business to be in business. It is the business of the private sector. If you know what, what we we'll need to look at is how can support initiative, just like we've seen in the run from the rice revolution, in terms of how to do this. And of course, help farm up chica. And that's why I'm talking about your question of digital application. That it is possible for you to help in terms of, there are apps that have been developed to partly do some of the function of the work which the marketing boss are doing. Because like I was saying, my friend who is in Israel, and of course, who is in Australia, who are talking about, look, listen, um, how can I connect with you people, with your farmers, through companies that, has, that have introduced agriculture to manage effectively uh, 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 marketing and market access? So that is, that is the problem. I don't think we can go back to the whole area of marketing boards or uh, you know, Western Nigeria marketing cocoa marketing board or Northern Nigeria marketing cocoa board. Um, before you know it, uh, you know, party men will be struggling again in terms of. Uh, other to be chair. Uh, I don't have anything against politics because politics is interesting, but it's important. Uh, uh, you know, but the point I'm making is that I don't wish to go back to on earth that uh, you know, such an arrangement. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Because of time, I'll just take um, probably two more questions. Yes. There's a question from Lukman Lawa. He said, uh, how can charity organizations key into agripreneur initiatives? Well, in terms of charity organization, um, what I want to say is that what we have is in terms of you want as a charity organization, you want to help your members who are farmers. Is that, the, is that what you are talking about um, as a charity organization um, or as a charity organization that want to help the disabled? You want to see how you can buy products at a reduced price. But the point I want to take, make is that, look, there is the concept of impact investing now. It's a cross between charity as well as ensuring that the investment has impact in terms of development. So the tendency these days, it will, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not disabusing, I'm not discouraging charity organization, uh, you know. Um, I mean, say for example, now during this period of pandemic, a lot of outfits, I'm sure Nasima also presented, uh, some members of our team presented rice and everything to the, you know. Um, you can link up our members. You can do something for the farmers through your organization by saying, okay, fine, I have my members who are, who, who are farmers, poor farmers who want to improve their holding. Small market, I mean, small holders farmers, as a charity organization, want to key into this initiative how can you help us link us up with countries and others who can help us you know in terms of uh, maybe child subsidized uh, 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 seedlings fertilizers you know, and other things like that i mean this is how my my mind is working as far as this is concerned all right um thank you very much uh ambassador because of time of course we can't take yes uh, please I'll um, take it okay um what are the benefits of being members of Nasima for businesses, apart from paying subscription? 
Well, I, I, have you finished the question or you want me to? He said businesses, businesses will want to know. So he wants to know. What are the yes, benefits? Th yes, thank you very much. Of course, there are, there are benefits. If you go on our line, you will see what are the benefits. If you join us and you participate, of course, in our meetings, we call you for our meetings, uh, ESCO and virtual meetings. But not only that, we are also the solid platform as far as reaching out to business and chambers across the world. People who want to enter Nigeria, a business outfit, say, for example, you are in the energy sector. The Nigerian power sector is a huge area waiting to tap. What happens is that people come to us and say, look, I'm looking for partners in Nigeria. I'm looking for partners on Nigeria. This is my area of operation. And they want credible partners. Let us be frank with ourselves. Um, even though stereotyping is not right as far as Nigeria is concerned, as a Nigerian diplomat of 35 years, that is the image which confronts you every time. Scam, 419, and you have to battle that. You have to teach people that that is not Nigeria. That is not. But the point is that when you join us, we can link you up effectively. I was just saying now that um, the mission in Italy and others are saying, look, these are some of the things we want from Nigerian businesses. Our mission, I'll give you an example in Burundi. The Burundi, because I haven't been in some of foreign services, I have an extensive network and link with very many of my colleagues who are still in the foreign service, other seven as a master. They say, look, you know, um, they use it. Please, you are there. People in Burundi are looking for companies who will come and invest in various sectors. They just, they just want Nigerian companies to come. I was in Sierra Leone the other time, and we were talking about ferry. The ferry that was being produced and ferry, are owned by most, mostly Nigerian. The creativity and urban sector, the other time they were asking for somebody who operates in the creativity sector. Our ambassador in Jakarta said, please, we need somebody to participate in the creative sector. One trillion is the creative sector. And don't forget 239 billion was that. Eventually, this, his name is Hakim Balogun. And I said, look, don't worry, we'll get you somebody. We were able to reach Poland St. Peters, who is your, one of the frontliners in the creative sector, and connect her down. And the moment they went online and looked at that, they said, we are ready to bring her here. They will pay, they will do this, they will do that. And she went. So these are some of the things. We are a glue. We connect people. We serve as a platform to connect those outside there who don't have knowledge of people in the Nigerian business sector. And, you know, and in terms of, so these are, these are the various benefits. There are so many of them. Uh, when you come into the house, you can be able to see that we serve delicious food. We have pandet yam, we have uh, gufe, we have, uh, so you can, you know, enjoy the sumptuous meal which we produce, which we serve. Uh, what I'm saying is that uh, Nasima as a national platform is a vegetable advocacy group is also a very useful tool to be able to network Nigerian businesses to the outside world. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. It's always a pleasure having you with us. Um, I can recall um, the wealth of experience you brought to bear during the, the WAS event as well. And um, you, you never disappoint. It's always very nice to have you around. So on this note, uh, I think we would want to call it a day. Thank you so thank much you for much. spending the last two hours with us. And I want to hand over uh, back to our prayer for her to uh, give the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Thank, Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shenaga. Thank you, Ambassador Lukoni. It was a very in-depth and um, insightful session. Of course, we have takeaways from today's session. Uh, we are not to, you asked us not to get engrossed with the thoughts of the COVID-19, the African Continental Free Trade um, Area Agreement is available to us for, to explore, to, um, to reopen and um, reboost the economy. Um, you equally told us that um, we missed, of course, we had a missed opportunity during the oil boom, where we all caught um, the Dutch disease. <laughs> we caught the Dutch disease, yes. Dutch disease. Yes. And yes, and um, getting back on track has been quite a little bit um, hard especially on sustainability, even though we've had different initiatives to get us back on track. But the issue of um, sustainability always, one way or the other, it creeps in somewhere. And that, of course, we need to handle. Then, of course, you um, called for the active involvement of the private sector in agribusiness and development. You asked that um, a company
open road map be developed on agribusiness in all states, not just at the national level now, we should go down to the grassroots as well. Then you told us that um, to revamp the agribusiness sector, of course, we have to look beyond production of agribusiness produce, exporting raw produce. We need to add value. Value add is the message. And of course, the key point here is the gap, which is an international initiative, the good agricultural practices. This we need to improve on at all stages from field um, to fork. And of course, it must be included in the roadmap and um, implementation strategy. Then, of course, we mentioned um, business initiatives targeted at um, encouraging the young people to be fully involved, to be actively involved in the um, agribusiness um, sector. Of course, young people out there, are the, we even, we're even happy that agribusiness, because at the sound of agriculture, what comes to mind are the hoes and the cut classes and all of that. But <laughs> right now, it's um, agribusiness, and that is more encouraging. Of course, there are different initiatives, like you mentioned, that, has, um, that are targeted towards encouraging people to do that. Then, of course, um, as with research institutions, so they can um, be, um, the researches would be replicated for actualization. Then, of course, an advi advice for our entrepreneurs, you look at Agrica as a business, professionalize the sector, be technologically um, driven, and of course, it is not a daily job, so we need to start gradually. It's baby steps, one step, and of course, we will get there. And of course, um, in that aspect of um, being technologically driven, that takes me to our next webinar, which holds on July 28th. We are exploring that um, avenue, that Adopting digitalization strategies for optimization. That, of course, is adding value to what we have. So, um, on this note, I'd like to thank Ambassador Lukoni once again for your time. Thank you for making out time from your busy schedule to join us for today's session. I thank Mr. Shenuga for moderating today's session. As usual, you've done a very great job, so thank you very much. Thank you to all our participants. Thank you so much for patience. For further information on um, the West Africa Agribusiness Show, please follow us on our social media handles. That's WAAS underscore exhibition. And on Facebook, we are West Africa Agribusiness Show. Of course, I'm your host for today, Okolu Aladipo. Thank you so much for joining us once again, and we hope to have you join us on our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Okolu. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you for the time, sir. Thank you very much, Okolu. Thank you very much. Um, for Thank you, sir. Being, uh, you know, for the link and uh, as well. Uh, let, please, let's stay in touch. We are there to work with people. Thank you very much. And I thank all our participants who have joined us uh, as we look forward to uh, when eventually these uh, will be over and then who will be. But for now, please let us all stay with the safety regulations and, 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 and the guidelines. So thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you all for joining. Thank you.